Crimson 15 podcast. I'm your host, Crimson Sin, and we got ourselves another Shira article. And uh, big thanks over to Anime Hunt over on Twitter for sharing this with me. And you guys can share stories with me about anything. If you think it'd be something cool for you, want to hear me talk about it. Over even over on our Discord, that's where you guys shared the the Swift Wind short that was uh came out yesterday. I did a review of that. Be sure to check that out. But right now we're gonna read another article that's just it's just awful. And you got a lot of uh, there's no these things aren't interviews. They're just like commercials. And this is from Ad Week. And I won't leave a link for the article because you have to like sign up, like. You have to like fill in all this stuff just to read an article. So F that crap. I did it so you guys won't have to. How Noelle Stevenson revived She-Ra for a new era. In rebooting a classic cartoon, she brought friendship, vulnerability, and inclusion to the fore. What, what did you say to the forefront? But just to the fore. She brought it to the fore. Uh, this thing's harsh. I'm going to read every uh, probably about two paragraphs at a time and then stop and then talk about it. So we begin. When DreamWorks reached out to Noel Stevenson to pitch a new She-Ra adaptation, it felt like one of those moments where you're in the right place at the right time, she tells Ad Week. Uh, that's not what happened. W- what happened was she had... Uh, DreamWorks is like, oh, you, we want you to make a show. So she's going through catalogs of old properties they had the rights to, and she was looking for a show with uh, primor- primarily a female cast. She had little to no knowledge of She-Ra whatsoever. So this wasn't like they were shopping She-Ra around and they found her. No, 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 no. It, it didn't happen like that at all. For someone who describes her previous work, including developing her graphic novel, Nimona? I, I have no idea what that is. I know she did Lumberjanes and a bunch of other garbage that sucks, but I've never even heard of this thing. As exploring, quote, subversion of classic fantasy and sci-fi tropes, especially when... They relate to female characters. This whole subversion of expectations and subversions of genres, I'm sick of it. It is not good. The last time something subverted a classic thing that was actually like a masterpiece would be like the Watchmen, what they did with superheroes. But now everyone's kind of, you know, ever since then, everyone's going to try to, I'm going to flip the script and it sucks every single time. You, You don't have... The the crafting ability to pull it off. You just suck at it. Uh, Especially when it relates to female characters. It was a natural fit. And it was one she handled so deftly. Oh my god, these people. Was there a thesaurus they just went through? Let's pick a fancy word for no reason. Adweek's editor selected her as an honoree in the year's Creative 100. Oh god. Oh, maybe maybe I'll look at this later, but um, that that that's for a tale for another day. Developing an adaptation of a character beloved by many children of the 1980s was a daunting challenge that Stevenson took seriously. <sighs> no, no, she didn't. She didn't take it seriously at all. She didn't. She wanted to tell her story. Everything else be damned. But at the same time, she didn't quote didn't want myself and my crew to feel constrained by that. Oh no, don't worry, Stevenson. You absolutely did. None of that. You took zero, anything into account besides names and places. Nothing else. There was no constraints whatsoever. I'm assuming Noel's still talking here. Quote, a lot of challenge was doing that while also being aware of the kind of shock that people would feel from seeing their characters reimagined, which was going to happen no matter what. Stevenson says, um, lies, lies, lies. If you would have, if the art would have been better, people would have been like, oh, okay, they try to give it a shot. Seeing how ridiculous all the character designs are, uh, Glimmer is a purple pair. Everyone's like, it's just a weird, they're just weird versions of themselves, like their original visions of these characters. And just to, even if, even with the crack character designs, if there was better art, if the animation was good and competent it would help so much if it was nice to look at but we have uh just flat character designs flat colors uh animation errors up the wazoo so this wouldn't have happened if it would have been good trust me i like how she she qualifies like oh no matter what we would have done it would have been terrible and everyone would have hated it no matter what 
No, you freaking dummy. You, you don't understand fandoms. You don't understand uh, when you create, especially when something from the past. It wasn't yours. So you had no hand in, in the creation of it. You're just a caretaker of these characters and these storylines. And instead, you crapped all over it. It's just, uh, God, every single time she, people talk about her, oh, it's a reimagining, you, you, which is fine. But what she did was a, a bastardization of it. It wasn't a reimagining. We decided on letting the show become its own thing and protecting the crew and its writers from being beholden to the original. This is the same crap that they what they did with Star Wars. And those movies suck hardcore. We don't want to be beholden. Think, make your own damn thing. Just make your own story about this warrior princess lady and just make it very She-Ra-like, but make it your own story. Why take something if you didn't care about it, if you pretty much hated it, why even redo it? Why? 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 Unless, unless you just want to crap all over the, the previous fans, which I'm I'm guessing was one of her motivations. Uh, behold it to the original so we could take the show in front of a new audience that didn't necessarily have, have to grow up with the original and bring them this new, fresh-feeling show so they could have their own Shira experience. Was there something preventing people from watching the original? Was there like an age scanner when you clicked on a video oh no you're too young to watch this you can never have a she-ra experience i i'm not understanding any of this noel you're a freaking idiot oh my goodness this thing's just i've read this once before and it's just exhausting while stevenson didn't grow up with she herself she quote developed an interest in the world and these characters while working in animation over the past several years so while she was working in other shows, she was watching Sierra. No, she didn't. She had no idea what it was. That's just a freaking lie. Uh, including Disney's Big Hero 6 and Tangled, DuckTales, Wander Over Yonder, which crafted two homages to He-Man during their stint as a staff writer. Well, they just named one, two, three, four. Four shows which crafted two hom homages to He-Man. So were there He-Man-like episodes in these shows? I'm guessing in Wander Over Yonder, I forgot who the bad guy was, but he's kind of like a Skeletor kind of bad guy. But Tangled, DuckTales, Big Hero 6, I'm not seeing the He-Man connection, okay? At a certain point, I really wanted a show to stand on its own. Shouldn't that be the goal of every story you tell? Shouldn't it always want to be able to... To be its own story without having to rely on everything. What? Why would you not want that to happen? She says, wanting to remain faithful to the original. <laughs> what aspect of this show is faithful to the original besides the names of characters and locations? Nothing else is faithful whatsoever. While evol evolving in a new direction. Evolving? God, shut up. The evolution is apparent in the show's transformation from the original title, She-Ra, Princess of Power, to She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. Reflecting on the increased focus on She-Ra's relationships to the show's other characters, Adora and She-Ra in the original always depended on her whole crew of characters. The other princesses were just as important as She-Ra was. Bo, Seahawk, they were heroes. They worked as a team. What the flying F are they talking about? Oh my god, it wasn't a show about Shira going around and winning the day and not getting help from anyone. She had a team. Seahawk had a whole crew of pirate guys. I don't know. The, whoever wrote this article didn't watch Shira. We know Noel Stevenson never watched it. They just are making crap up. One of the aspects of the original she loved had certainly survived. She, she never saw the original. I guarantee you she never watched the whole thing. She looked at a Wikipedia article, and that's about it. The villains seem almost like dual protagonists, as an aspect she expanded considerably while still keeping the plots of the foes like Catra and Scorpio tied into the show's central theme of friendship. Um, it's good to show that there is, um, I don't know, say like a redeemable side or a human side to your uh, bad guy characters, but... That's not happening here. It's just Catra goes through a lot of emotional. She's an emotional roller coaster. She's the best. She's the best character in the show. But it's just because she's in constant. She's constantly being betrayed, shunned, and it's just. It's good storytelling, but he needs to go somewhere now. We have two seasons of Catra being betrayed. She needs to evolve as a character, 
And uh, Scorpia and Catra theme of friendship. I thought Scorpia wanted to get in her pants. How's that friendship? And she's kind of lusting after Catra. It's, it's very creepy because she's like way older than she is. And th- this is the only thing in this article that I say is 100% true. I tend to re- relate to villains more often because they're the ones <laughs> that have the license to be messy. I understand that she relates to the villains because she herself is a villain. In her heart, she has mean outlooks, outlook, outlooks on people, excuse me. And she hated her parents. She hated her mom. She hated society because I'm gay and everyone hates me. So she relates to a villain. That, that's not a good thing, Noel. That's a very bad thing. But this next uh, sentence makes no sense. Uh, they were the ones that had a license to be messy and to express emotions that heroes weren't necessarily allowed to express. What? Says who? Is there some uh, rule book or something where you're not allowed to have your heroes to to express emotions? What? This is where you would put examples. This is where you would say, hey, in this other show, the hero was always a good guy and they always win. And this is the specific examples of that happening. But in the last, what, 15 years, cartoons have expanded beyond all this. I mean, go back to uh, Avatar the Last Airbender. The, all those characters, when you first meet them, and their first appearances to the very last episode, they are completely different characters that they grew, they learned, they won, they lost, they had failures, they had victories. None of that's present in Shira so far. I know it's only two seasons, but none of that, no one has grown any. Catra has been kind of up and down, but she keeps deciding to do the wrong thing. So she hasn't really grown. But where's this whole thing where heroes can't be allowed to express things? Like, what the hell is she talking about? She says, this show is about friendship. Is it? But I also wanted to show that sometimes friendships can, friendship can be hard. Sometimes relationships can be messy and difficult. And you can rise above that. What, where, when are friendships hard? Um, I'm trying. This is me trying to make this sentence work with what we've seen in Shira so far. Uh, except for Glimmer's always crapping on Bo like with Bo has something personal in his life and he doesn't want to share it with Glimmer Glimmer's constantly like well how come you didn't tell me about your your parents because it's none of your damn business you freaking purple pair shut the hell up it's none of your business he doesn't have to tell you every single little thing about his personal life but Bo's always subservient to, to Glimmer so he always forgives her always so there's no there's no difficulty in the friendship there um the, the relationship of Mermista and Seahawk is weird because she obviously likes him. He is, of course, likes her, but she treats him like crap all the time. So uh, that's a weird relationship, but that's not really a friendship. That's like a boyfriend-girlfriend thing. Um, Katra and Adora. Katra is weird in love with Adora to the point to where it's like, oh, if you won't love me, I'm going to kill you. That's crazy. <laughs> it's not a good... The way Katra has her feeling towards Adora are crazy feelings. Adora to Catra, she's a little sister. I don't see any romance at there at all in any way. She just grew up with her and thought they were family. Even in that book, which I reviewed, uh, the right, the origins of a hero, or uh, she said, oh, we, we, we saw each other as sisters. So if that's to be taken into canon, she doesn't have phys- uh, uh, any type of physical relationship uh, towards Catra. So... Um, the hardships of friendship and relationships, thats none of this is in the show. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. What In what episodes do you feel like they tackled any of this? They tackled, quote, this is a show about, uh, about friendship. And I always wanted to show that sometimes friendships can be hard. Sometimes relationships can be messy and difficult. And then you can rise above. Again, point out these things. I don't think it's happened. That hasn't been resolved in five second conversations between Glimmer and Bo. There are those, these core relationships, like between Catra, or between Adora and Catra, that are broken and at this fundamental level. And so much of the show is about examining that. It's broken because Catra is a bad guy and she has weird feelings she doesn't know how to deal with. Is she sexually attracted to? her best friend or is this a weird jealousy thing is it it's just she's an odd lady and <laughs> Catra is Adora just she would accept Catra back this second if she came like snuck out of the fright zone or whatever and said hey 
uh, I'm leaving the horde. I want to join you guys. Adora would take her in a second because that's her friend and she cares about her. So I don't understand this broken thing. I don't think it's broken. It's just one-sided. In the original series, the relationship between Adora and Catra was defined by jealousy. It kind of is again. If you think about it, she's jealous of everything Adora has been, was, you know, picked number one by Shadow Reaver. Shadow Reaver always gave her special treatment. Uh, Adora was able to lead her team and all the things, all the things Catra has never been able to do. So it kind of is jealousy. Something which tends to be applied as a stereotypical and shallow female emotion, Stevenson says. Uh, because men can never be jealous. Not, never in the history of all cartoons and all writing and all media of all time, men have never been jealous of other men. What the hell are you talking about, Stevenson? You freaking idiot. Uh, we did want to change that a little and take a deeper look at the feelings of jealousy, including how it came from a place of love. That episode in season one, episode 11, which I still think is the best episode in the series, check out my review of that. It's a, it's a beautifully done episode, and Noelle wrote that episode. So she can write when she wants to, but it showed how Catra was secretly jealous of Adora growing up their whole entire lives. Adora was not aware of it. She just thought, oh, kid sister, I'm going to protect you. Don't worry. Uh, anytime something's difficult, I'll take care of it. And that whole time, it was making Catra feel like the lesser and not the equal. But Adora can't know that unless you express those feelings. And she didn't express it till, what, 16 years later. And she was jealous of her the whole time. So, like, when Adora became force captain and Catra at the time was like, oh, who cares? Just more responsibilities. I don't want that. And Adora's like, what do you mean? Like, you told me you didn't want to be force captain. Every single time I brought it up, you told me you didn't want it. And then, of course, Catra breaks down. She's like, of course I wanted it. I wanted it to be special and everything. Dummy, tell me about it then. How was she supposed to know? That's interesting. That's good story. That's good character development. But it doesn't go anywhere after the episode. They just go back to just being bad, good guy, bad guy again. So there's room for the story to grow. It's just they're stunted by their own stupidity and they won't let it grow. Again, back to the article. Sorry. Similarly, the show embraces the gray areas in conflict that cartoons typically paint as starkly good versus evil. Again, let's go back to Last Airbender. Everything Zuku did in the beginning seasons would capture the Avatar. You think, oh, he's just a bad guy. But there's reasons behind it. And he wanted to win his honor back. He wanted his father to love him. And all those things, those came from, that's from a place of wanting to please your father and it's just there there's gray areas there so it's not like you invented anything stop pretending you're some trailblazing you know first to first you're not you're just another in a long line of political identity politics and uh message first story second just stop the show is about the struggle between dark and light is it what what it's the struggle between an incompetent army in the horde versus a slightly less incompetent rebellion. That, that's what the story is about. Even the heroes have darkness in them. Villains are not pure evil. What heroes have darkness? Let's go down all the heroes in the show. Adora, where's her darkness? She's just kind of a blockhead. Glimmer, what darkness? Uh, she's a little selfish, but that's not darkness. Bo, uh, Gordon Goodbrother, no darkness. Perfuma, hippie or hippie extraordinaire, no darkness. Mermista, she's kind of a bitch, but not darkness. Seahawk, uh, silly pirate guy, no darkness. Uh, queen Angela, she's the queen, no darkness. Uh, who am I missing? Swiftwind, com com communist horse, eh, she's kind of an idiot, but again, no darkness. Um, even minor characters, Madame Rass, nothing. She was in one episode. She showed Shira the, you know, gave her some information about Mara. No darkness. Light Hope? I think she's pragmatic about solving the problem. Not necessarily darkness. Again, no darkness. Am I missing anyone? Frosta. Um, went from like a cool, confident young lady to goofball pun lady in season two. Again, no darkness. I think I named every hero. Uh, and trapped a kind of became a bad guy so no darkness on the good guy side correct me if i'm wrong name me a good guy character that has darkness in them i'm not seeing it villains are not pure evil um hordak is pure evil 
He's one of the villains. There, there is no redeeming quality to this guy. All the other characters, you can say they're following orders. The whole Scorpio, how, why her family joined the bad guys? Because other princes looked at me funny and they thought I was scary looking. Are you effing kidding me, you freaking idiot? Uh, and Entrapta, I believe, is evil because she doesn't care if she hurts people. And that's an evil trait. And she Would she do it on purpose? Mm, maybe not. But she doesn't care if she does. So pure evil that's that's the uh, you know it's not like a light switch where if you flip it on it's evil and you flip it off it's not evil they're kind of in the middle leaning towards evil a lot of the characters and then you have people like Kyle um Lonnie uh lizard dude i think they're just following orders and they were just orphans and they're just soldiers in an army so they don't they don't control what's happening so eh, whatever kind of another key aspect of the show is vulnerability <laughs> what what? Shira, like her brother, He Man, again, people have been uh, still bringing it up to this day that Kyle is uh, Adam, Prince Adam. That's not going to ever happen because they don't have the rights to any of the Masters of the Universe characters or He Man characters. So we'll never see Skeletor, He Man, Man at Arms. None, none of those people are going to ever be in this, which kind of sucks because she's supposed to be a twin and her brother and her are supposed to be this, you know power duo but it's never going to happen so i don't know why they bring up he-man because it has nothing to do with anything and this next sentence is an absolute lie like her brother he-man was originally an invincible unflappable demigod who conveyed constant confidence he-man had failures i know it's it was a show built to sell toys and it was like oh we have all these episodes and they can go into syndication you know Uh, back then there was all about how many time slots you can fill up and how many toys you can sell but it wasn't just him being invincible all the time. He did have a lot of uh, ups and downs. And of course, it was the 80s, so he was going to have more victories and failures. But it wasn't just like, I'm an unstoppable guy and I fix everything. This person never watched T-Man. They never watched She-Ra. A demigod who conveyed constant confidence. That swagger was part of She-Ra's charm, but it also kept her from seeing true relatability. And when it comes to terms of storytelling and characters, I think the original She-Ra did a better job than He-Man. Because in She-Ra, she used her friends more to help. And everyone was more of a team. Kind of He-Man, yeah, he was the big powerful guy. He did have his teammates. But I think She-Ra just did it a little bit better. So I don't know. This whole this, the, That whole uh, paragraph can just be stricken from the record because it doesn't even make any damn sense. In the new show... Each character, including Shira and Katra, experienced moments of greatness and moments of defeat. What, what were the moments of defeat for uh, for Swiftwind? Uh, he didn't get uh, uh, as many horses to sign up for the Communist Party. Where were his moments of defeat? Because they said every char- each character. This should have said some characters because it's not every character. Where were? Uh, I don't get it. No, no one. That's not a true statement. They're 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 overselling this. Like, hardcore. If you were just to read this article, you would think, this is Avatar 2.0. It's not even close to that. They doubt themselves some days and suffer from hubris on others. <laughs> You'll suffer from your hubris. It's an aspect that characters... Uh, it's an aspect that creates tension in the show's story arcs. What story arcs? There hasn't been an arc of anything. They consider one episode's arcs. Oh, the 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 Bo's uh, uh, gay fathers uh, the, that their arc, one episode with a bunch of stupid silly humor. That's not an arc. In Trapta's arc, what arc? They you they don't understand what this word means. Stop freaking using it. Given that the forces of good won't always triumph. Um, I guess at the end of the prom episode, my God, that episode's horrific. The bag the good the bad guys kind of won, and the good guys were you know on the losing side because. Glimmer and Bo got captured, I think. And, but that, but it's solved the very next episode and they get out and they win. So, and I'm understanding where they're not always triumphed. They, they, they have triumphed every time. If there was like a good four or five episode stint of the bad guys winning, taking land, destroying villages, uh, capturing a, a bunch of uh, villagers and stuff, but it never happens. They always win. But more importantly, it shows young viewers that perfection isn't a reality. The, the quality of animation lets them know that perfection is not a reality. The, the jumbled up, uh, in-between art, the how ugly everyone looks, that's their symbol that things aren't pre- prefer- perfect. Not the fact that the good guys don't always win, which they actually do always win. So what are they talking about? 
quote, the characters are struggling a lot and failing a lot and and showing that's okay, she said. Strength comes from our vulnerability. Strength comes from understanding your weaknesses and turning your weaknesses into strengths. I've always believed in that, and this show doesn't show that. It kind of just like, oh, just like in that the D&D episode, they were trying to come up with a plan, but they decided, well, we work best when we just wing it, so they just go out there and do whatever the hell they want, and they win. How's that showing strength from their vulnerabilities? I guess their vulnerability would be they can't, they don't have a coherent thought process, but that's not true. They haven't shown that at all in the show. She may think that, but there's no examples. This is where you would throw in examples. Oh, when in episode three of season two, when someone did this, they learned from their weaknesses. And just because they're deficient in one area doesn't mean they can't be good in another and be part of the team and bring something of value. That's how you would frame this. Not just throw out a statement with no qualifiers. Citation needed. But all the changes that Stevenson and her team brought to Shira and the Princess of the Power, the most discussed is how the show has dramatically evolved the way the original and most animation portrayed women. This, 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 this lie that there were never strong female characters till this show. Notice how they always do that. There was never a strong female character till Captain Marvel came out. There was never a strong female character till she and the Princess of Power. There was never a strong, powerful female character till Batwoman came out. There is no past. There is no future. There is the only the now. And whatever I create is the first of everything. Stop doing that. That that's it's not only is it demonstrably not true. It's dishonest, and you're lying to your audience. Don't do it. It's ridiculous. You can have strong females. There's been plenty of strong female characters all throughout the history of literature to today. You didn't invent it. You're not breaking ground. Shut up. Oh my goodness. The new show features a wide range of ethnicities and body types while also embracing severally openly gay characters. Here's the funny thing about the ethnicities of people and their races. Uh, this is an Earth. And there just seems to be random brown people everywhere in... in uh, an Eternia. So there's really not like, oh, that those are white people, those are black people, those are Mexican, those are Asian. None of it matters because everything's kind of like this big blob of like everyone just lives everywhere. So there's really no distinction. So body types, um, there's no beautiful characters. There's just fat characters and flat skinny characters. <laughs> there's really, really no in between. Uh, while embracing severally openly gay characters, Bo's parents, openly gay. Nah, net, uh, net, net, Tassa and Spinner Girl, Spinderell are, are openly gay. And Scorpia, because she wants to get in uh, Catra's 16 year old pants and she's like 27. Creepy. But that's it. And it's weird though. Catra, it's super weird. Does she, she is in love with the door to the point to where I think she's willing to kill her and wear her skin and pretend to be her. She's like crazy. So I don't even know if it's a, a, a gay love for a door and more of like I it's it's an obsession. So it's only a couple of characters and we're talking Bo's dads, which we'll probably maybe see once or twice in the whole entire series. So it's not important. Uh, Natasha and Spinnerell, they've only been in... Uh, the season finale, they had maybe two lines of dialogue. And in season two, they didn't even speak. Again, completely backwards characters. And I guess the only real character we've seen a lot of is Scorpia. But her gay love for Catra is creepy as all hell. So I don't understand why that that's important in any way. I was really excited to explore as many different ways of showing female characters as possible, Stevenson said, except for beautiful and you know, uh, physically attractive that that wasn't, those are the impossibilities in the show. Actually light spinner. She was pretty hot, but that, you know, she, that was like, she was a woman and that was like a flashback in animation. There tends to be more variety of male characters while women tend to fall into much narrower range. Again, citations needed. What are you talking about? There's all kinds of male characters all over the place. Look different. There's all kinds of female characters in animation. What in the F are you talking about? This is her grievance. This uh, pretend it can, uh, when it comes to someone who is a constant victim, a professional victim is like, you know, hello, I'm Noel Stevenson, professional victim. 
They see what happened to them. She's gay. And of course, her parents didn't like that. So I got to hate everything. Everything's against me. Because as soon as I stop pretending that, I have to be responsible for the way things are in my life. But if I can continue to blame everyone else, it's out of my control. It's just society. It's a horrible way to live. Uh, while women fall into a much narrow range, I wanted to push their silhouettes in a way that made them feel really iconic and really distinct from one from each other. Um, you do that with personalities. You do that with uh, how characters interact with each other, how they handle certain situations. Not just with uh, uh, outward appearances. That's terrible. Your characters should be distinguished by their actions and their feelings and their thoughts and what they believe in and what they're willing to stand for, not for the way they look. That's the most absolutely, that's judging a book by its cover. That's being, oh, you look this way, that makes you different from that person who looks that way. No, we're all fighting this war together. That's terrible, Noel. It's absolutely awful. And here we go. If you begin any sentence like this, as a gay woman, Stevenson took personal pride in helping create a show that pushed the boundaries of how children programming portrays gender and sexuality. I, I have never started a conversation with, hello, I'm a male Hispanic. Like, that's not important. Uh, I'm a straight male Hispanic. No, no that, that is the least important thing you need to know about me. How good are you are a writer? What kind of characters do you want to build? Well, life experiences are important, but you, you don't open that way. It's the most ridiculous, shallow part of your existence. I don't care if you're gay or straight or whatever the any of those other letters stand for. Are you a good person? Are you kind? Are you creative? Do you have uh, different ways of approaching problems? All those things build you as a human being. And the very last thing that should define you is your sexuality. I don't know. Call me crazy. This approach, she says, allowed the writers to explore emotions. Characters animation don't normally get the show. Again, what are you talking about? The, the um, emotions. And I keep going back to Last Airbender because it's that's a roller coaster of emotions. Zuku ran away from his gra his, uh, his uncle. He kind of left them. They kind of left them bad terms. But Zuku grew and became a better person. Ah, a ton of time passes. He, they find the camp of the White Lotus and he knows his uncle's there. So he gets that, okay, I got to meet, I got to talk to my uncle again. And he's sleeping. And Zuko just sits there. Doesn't wake him up. And he just waits for the morning. And he's just apologizing. I'm so sorry, Uncle. All the things that I did. I know you must be so disappointed in me. You must hate me. But I'm trying to do better. And he's, he's bearing his soul. And then his uncle just hugs him. And he's like, I knew you were lost. But I had to let you find your own way. I couldn't force you down the path. I, I could show it to you. But I knew you would walk the path. And you would end up, you would end up being to a family again absolutely the one of the most beautiful scenes of all the animation show cartoons have animation you didn't invent this nothing even close to that even in episode that episode in season one with catcher while i love that episode it doesn't even touch the emotional roller coaster that is zuku and his uncle so you didn't you didn't push any boundaries you just waddled around you didn't even get to the edge of the envelope yet so you didn't push anything ah <sighs> And expect boundaries while staying true to the characters in the show. Oh yeah, sure, okay. Thumbs up on that one. The show's characters are reflective of a diverse casting crew, including an all-females writer room. <laughs> ne never has one sentence completely contradicted another sentence. I'll read it again because it makes no sense. The show's characters are reflective of its diverse casting crew, including an all-females writer's room. How is an all-females writer's room diverse? They're all female. What? I freaking hate these people. They're so stupid. That doesn't mean anything. There are certain things in life where you can say, oh, men and women are different when it comes to this. Yeah, writing and like the creative arts, we're kind of all equal. Uh, someone who paints a picture, regardless of male or female, has the same ability to paint as the other gender. It doesn't matter. We're not talking about lifting weights or running a race. That's a physical, muscle-based type of thing. This is an intellectual-based so anyone can write. There's, did you know there's never been a female author, author of anything ever and before Shira? Did you, did you guys know that? Oh, my God. Something Stevenson said she was not deliberate. Oh, sure thing. It wasn't deliberate. Just all the best writers in all the world happened to all be female. She it wasn't deliberate. Not one bit. 
but as a result of searching for writers, quote, deeply interested in stories of women. This is so stupid. This is something Marvel Comics does. If the character's black, like Black Panther, only a black person can write it. The character is uh, Muslim, like uh, Miss Marvel, Camilla Khan, Miss Marvel, only someone of her same race and gender can write that character. That is so racist and so narrow-minded, it makes me sick. I would love to write a, a character in a comic book or a story, but will I have to be forced to make that character Hispanic and male just like me? Because I'm unable to understand any other race or gender besides my own? You racist piece of garbage. Stop with this stupid crap. Deeply interested because I a male can't be interested in, in, in the feelings and thoughts and the, the hero's journey of a female. There's, man, we just hate those women. That's why we marry them and have children because we just hate women so much. For many of the writers on the show, it was a welcome change of experiences. Being one of the only women in the room filled with male writers, she says. Well, that's who they hire and they want to... Do you honestly think Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Disney go, you know what? There's these 10 amazing female writers, but I hate women so damn much. I'm going to hire these three lesser uh, talented males instead. It never happens that way. It happens because whoever has the best ideas and who's best for the job, their gender has nothing to do with it. You freaking dummy. Oh my goodness. We're almost done. I promise. She adds that one of the truly special things about the show is that it's a collaborative at every level, with everyone bringing their own points of view to the process in a way that, quote, made the world feel more alive, made the characters more real, and helped flesh it out in a way that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, stories by committee, I don't necessarily like, because when you say written by, shouldn't you have a list of everybody if it was truly uh, uh, everyone working on it? It was a, a collaborative process. Shouldn't it be... 10 writers on every episode. You do take uh, ideas and thoughts and you bounce ideas off your other creators, but it's your story. This is what you're writing and needs to be what you want. So I don't necessarily agree with that and made the world filled more alive. Well, that's a lie. What is one of the biggest complaints about Shira is the world feels empty. The world feels unlived in. The world feels like there's maybe a thousand people on this whole planet. So it doesn't make you feel more alive. It doesn't make the characters feel more real. What's real about any of these characters? They're all like stereotypes. So I, I'm, I'm not getting what, what they're talking about here. Stevenson says, when she first got into animation around five years ago, there were, weren't were really any shows with female protagonists. That's 2015. So this isn't like Noel, and this is like, let's say, cartoons from like the late 70s to 80s. You can kind of maybe say that, but even that wasn't true. There's been female characters in cartoons forever, especially since 2015. I mean, um, what Star vs. the Forces of Evil came out in 2015. Uh, you have main female characters in tons of shows. So I don't know what she's talking about. She just has this perceived fake grievance that can never be remedied. That you can never spill enough blood. You can never take enough treasure. I will always be this victim until the day I die. And that's Noelle Stevenson in a nutshell. And that's why her writing sucks. While she and the Princess of Power now represents one of the one of the number of shows bringing fresh perspectives to animation. Again, this is where a citation is needed. What other shows do they think bring a fresh perspective to animation? They don't say any. They just make a claim. They never back it up. Final paragraph. I think it's really important to have certain shows where different viewpoints are centered in a way that they don't feel... They don't often get to be, she says. That creates new stories that you might not have necessarily seen before. And then it just the, the article just dies. <laughs> the, every single one of these interviews and articles that I've read about Shira, it just seems it stops. There must have been a word, um, the uh, word limit they needed to get to, and once they got to that, they just stopped talking. This is where you would say, "Oh, in this episode, we wanted to focus it from Scorpius' point of view, so we can, you know, it shows you that even though she's on." the bad guy team. She has her own feelings and thoughts about things and she cares about her friends and she really wants to protect Katra and she will do anything to protect them. Even though she's fighting the good guys, she's very loyal and that's a different perspective that I'd like to see from the uh, antagonist point of view. Th that's what you say. Why can't they say that? Why can't they ever bring up a freaking example? Because when you just throw a statement out there and you don't back it up with anything, it 
means nothing. So this article is dead. Eric Oster, you're a dummy. Adweek, you wasted your time making this. And my God, um, there's potential here. There's there's characters that can grow into certain things. And I do have another video coming up soon, probably maybe next week, where I want to see what I want to see in season three. I did one for what I wanted to see in season two. None of that stuff came true. But I still have ideas and thoughts. This ship can be turned around to be something good to great. It can never be a, like legendary because they already screwed it up too much. But it can be a great show. There's things they can actually do that are, aren't too hard. That aren't out of the realm of possibility. But um, I don't think they're going to do it. Uh, man, what a, what, a, what a crappy article. What a, what a bunch of lies and just these big giant fluff pieces. No one deserves this. Carmen San Diego for its rough start ended really well. And we don't have a season two of that yet. Not even uh, any whispers of a season two. And that show had a very unique look, had a cool main female character, and she kind of grew into her own. Why don't bring up that show? That's another Netflix show. But it's like it seems that they don't care about that. I, I don't even know if it's going to get a season two, which is unfortunate because I can see a lot of cool things happening in season two. But um, Shira, again, thank you for all these articles. They're just so much freaking fun to read just to get into the psyche of Noelle Stevenson and her craziness. But um, thanks again. Thank you, Anime Hunt, for sharing this on Twitter. Uh, you guys can do that too. Join our Discord server. There's a link in the description below. Share our thoughts and ideas. Uh, we had a pretty cool dissection over on Discord where people were redesigning the characters and they actually came up with some really cool looking redesigns. And, um, you know, continue the discussion over there. Keep it in the comments. We can just, you know, keep it going because I actually love talking with all you guys. I do read all the comments and I appreciate every single one of them. See you guys next time. Season 3 is right around the corner. Crimson Saint here. Thanks for watching the video. If you're enjoying the content, be sure to sub, like, share, and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss a single upload. If you have any tips or story ideas, hit us up on Twitter at C15Podcast, or better yet, join our Discord server. Link in the description below.